Aloha, I am back. And uh, I'll just start off by saying that uh, the Leafs lost last night. Nobody cares. It was a sad day in our house last night. Yeah. It was 2 1. Anyway, I don't personally care about hockey. I just support the husband because that's what a good wife does, right? And there's no more merch until they win a cup. Mind you, hopefully we're not going to be here much longer. And I don't know how much longer sports is going to go on the way this world's going. Anyways, I'm in the car again. Only because it's I wanted to go sit outside. Um, find a nice patch of grass. I'm back to one of my parking spots. And I hate to be in the car, people. But it, it was a rainy day today. So I was actually going to go sit in the grass. But I'm like, oh yeah, under a tree. But I'm like, it freaking was raining all morning. And it was really... Well, it's overcast again. But then it got a little sunnier out. It was really low pressure and... I'm like, oh yeah, I can't sit in the grass. It's going to be, I'm going to have a wet ass. So, um, my jeans. So, anyway, so I'm in the car because I was going to get out. And then I'm like, oh, it's wet still. Anyways, I wanted to read something. And I've been thinking about this passage too in Galatians, Galatians 2. But I was going to read something from uh, Martin Zender's First Day in, in Heaven. And I didn't know what I was going to read. I thought I was going to read something else. And then I. I was like, you know what? I've got this book. I've got my little book bag with me. With it's got my scriptures in it, and it's got a couple different things. It's got first, it still has first Indian heaven in it, and uh, so I wanted to read something because uh, it's important. And I'm going to start at uh, page 187. I'm just going to read a couple, like a page or two, and because um, there was one of the scriptures I portion that I wanted to read, and it's in this. It's containing this. And I was like, oh, good. It's containing this. So I'm going to start. Um, uh, 187, and it's talking about the difference between the the circumcision gospel and the, cir the uncircumcision gospel, between the Israelite evangel and the Gentile evangel, of the Twelve, and then of Paul. And something that's said in here by Martin is, is true, because I always wondered about that too. I'll get to that, about there's 12 thrones in the millennial um, kingdom. And uh, not 13, right? Paul's the 13th, so to speak. But uh, he's separated. He's not part of that. And I always wondered that too when I was a Christian. So did Paul. It's like, well, it's Paul there, like, right? Anyways, because when they drew straws after Judas was gone, they it wasn't Paul that got picked, right? Anyways, this is talking about justification. And uh, so I'm just going to start with this right here. Um. So with Israel, flesh is still recognized. In Israel, Jew and Greek remain. As I said, these must remain because there are 12 thrones in the kingdom, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. What about Paul's throne? There are not 13 thrones. I wondered about this. Poor Paul. He has the most awesome energetic he was the most awesome energetic apostle of them all. Where was his throne? Now I know. So anyone is a Christian. Let's say this. Think about this. Because I always wondered this too. Paul does not have a throne on earth. His future is not tied to earth. Only Paul announced the truth. There is neither Jew nor Greek. This is beyond radical. Peter never did quite understand. And Peter does say this. That Paul's, in 1st or 2nd Peter, he says Paul's writings are hard to understand. His words are hard to understand. Not to be a Jew, how could it be? Yet Paul, in the book of Philippians, despises his nationality and throws it away. Either this is dangerous and stupid, or else it sits at the core of the most liberating message ever to visit humanity. For the love of Christ is constraining us, judging this, that, if one died for the sake of all, consequently all died. And he died for the sake of all that those who are living should by no means still be living to themselves, but to the one dying and being roused for their sakes. Let me my page. So that we, from now on, are acquainted with no one according to the flesh. Yet even if we have known Christ according to flesh, nevertheless, now we know him so no longer. So that if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The primitive passed by. Lo, there has come new. Didn't Jesus say too? Behold, I make all things new. 
So that's 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verses 14 to 17 in the Concordance of the New Testament. New creation takes the old humanity, shoves it into the grave with Christ, and considers it dead. New creation also takes the earthly Jesus, including his words in red, and puts him behind us, replacing Jesus with the glorified Christ. We no longer know Christ according to flesh. Only then can it be said, there is a new creation. If one died for the sake of all, consequently all died. Such sweeping death eliminates all physical advantage. This message is the death knell to Israel. Therefore, this message never came from Peter's lips. With Israel, it's all about physical advantage. Yes, the flesh must be fixed. Israel will begin, will be given a new heart, enabling her present flesh to be remolded into Messiah's image. But this is not Paul's message. Paul's message is, we have started from scratch. I am no longer living, he says, but living in me is Christ. Galatians 2.20. And that was one scripture that I was wanting to read from today. So that's great. I am no longer living. No one has ever heard such a thing. Israel merely reforms the flesh. The cross eradicates it. This was the cross's deepest aspect, hidden from Peter at Pentecost and from Israel as a whole. Thus, a nation in spirit, nations in spirit, outstri outre sorry, I gotta start over. Sorry, guys. Thus, the nations in spirit outreach Israel. Israel still wrestles with her sins, while the nations see sin so far removed that in one moment they are worshiping idols, and the next they are praising Christ for divine completion. And we do. It's where Christianity is still trying to beat their flesh in submission, and it doesn't work. And you are incomplete in him, who is the head of every sovereignty and authority, in whom you were circumcised also with a circumcision not made by hands, in the stripping off of the body of flesh, in the circumcision of Christ, being entombed together with him in baptism, in whom you were roused together also through faith in the operation of God, who rouses him from among the dead, you also being dead to the offenses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He vivifies us together jointly with him, dealing graciously with all our offenses, erasing the handwriting of the decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and has taken it away out of the midst, nailing it to the cross, stripping off the sovereignties and authorities. With boldness, he makes a show of them, triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2, verses 10 to 15. How could this completion how could completion happen so fast? For a Jew, this would take years of training and devotion in festivals, years of bringing your lamb to Jerusalem, baptizing yourself, weeping upon your prayer mat. But for a human of the nations, the flesh problem disappears in a single declaration by Paul. So that we, from now on, are acquainted with no one according to flesh. Yet even if we have known Christ according to flesh, nevertheless, now we know him so no longer, so that if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation, the primitive passed by, lo, there has come new, there it is again, Second Corinthians 5, 16, 17. Corpses cannot be reformed, and they can't. If one died for the sake of all, consequently all died, Second Corinthians 5, 14. Thus the beneficiaries of Paul's gospel are freed from ever again having to worry about or fix flesh. Their identity is now tied to Christ's, his circumcision is their circumcision. His death is theirs. His entombment is their entombment. And because he rose from the dead, they are now to reckon themselves as being raised with him. It says, see my book, How to Be Free from Sin While Smoking a Cigarette. Ah, oh, Martin. He's a jokester. Great writer, too. Paul had never known Christ according to flesh. We have no record that the Pharisee Saul ever gazed in the eyes of the terrestrial Jesus. A good thing. It was easier for Saul than to grasp the greater depth of the cross accomplished by the glorified one. Sorry, turn my page again. Sitting at the right, the glorified one sitting at the right hand of God. Yet still Paul had baggage. All the Jews did. This concept of I die with Christ does not find an easy home with in one who for his entire life, dedicated himself to the eradication, eradication of flesh. He was a Pharisee. In one revelation, 
Oh, sorry, radicate flesh, flesh. How can flesh be gone in a day? In one flash of inspiration? In one revelation? Jews were burdened with baggage. The nations never had baggage. Thus, the nations could more readily receive and believe a message of pure grace. They had never heard anything different. In the sense, then, in a sense, then, the depth and hopelessness of sin is good preparation for slosh bucket application of God's unmerited favor. You are so far gone that you realize nothing can fix or reform you. Your only hope is a new creation, a clean sweep of the old. Thank God that this is accomplished by another, complete without you. Because in your deepest heart, you know your inadequacy for the task, indeed. Therefore, Jesus could more easily speak with tax collectors and prostitutes and publicans. They knew that their need, but still, they were Israelites. Still, they had baggage. Still, they looked for a Messiah who could help them be worthy. Worthy? Contrast worthiness with the following from Paul's letter to Romans. Romans 6. There's the verse. Chapter, verse 4 and 7. We then are entombed together with him through baptism into death, that even as Christ was roused from among the dead through the glory of his Father, thus we also should be walking in newness of life. For if we have become planted together in the likeness of his death, nevertheless we shall be of the resurrection also. Knowing this, that our old humanity was crucified together with him, that the body of sin may be nullified for us by no means to be still living for sin, for one who dies has been justified from sin. Romans 6, 4, and 7. Sin always was a problem. An Israelite had to at least try to stop sinning. Sounds sounds familiar, right? There's some other people that are always trying to stop sinning. Mm. For sin, God gave the law. Law, however, was merely a prettying up of the dandelion. God had to first show humanity the futility of beautifying the outside. Yet for centuries, he tarried from the outside. He set forth a program, the law, to pretty up from without. Even when the new covenant was announced, as I have said, it gave the same body, the Israel body, a new heart. Sin was still fought against, but fought against with a higher inner power. With Paul, on the other hand, sin was no longer fought against. Sin was done away. The old humanity, the one that sinned, has been considered crucified with Christ. The deeper, deepest aspect of Christ's suffering is the death of the old humanity. This truth is still completely unknown to Israel, as well as to most modern-day Christians. We, not Israel, are planted together in the likeness of his death. Quote, unquote. Everything that happened to Christ happened to us. The result is astounding. For one who dies has been justified from sin. Romans chapter 6, verse 7. Justification from sin goes so much deeper than forgiveness, which was the only thing available to Israelites through law. Forgiveness says, you did wrong, but we will overlook the penalty. Justification says, you did not even do wrong. In fact, you are right. How can this be? Only one way. God must be looking at a new creation. He cannot justify the old creation ever. God must do something with humanity that will enable him to look upon it with new eyes. So he did. He killed the old humanity, the whole of it, along with his son. In God's mind, when his son died, the, the old humanity died. Thus, when God now sees us, he sees his son. We're a new creation in Christ. How beautiful is justification from sin instead of forgiveness? Well, there's forgiveness, but be justified. You're crucified with him. Understanding that we are crucified. When he died, we died. We are crucified with him. We are buried with him. Sin was left in the grave with him. And that we're, we're resurrected with him. And we'll be glorified with him. We're becoming more and more like Christ every day. Well, as much as we can while we're on this earth. But someday, soon, 
we're going to see him. And when we see him, we're told in the scriptures, we'll be like him. That's good news. I hope that anyone that's listening does not understand this because I, it's totally Christianity. And I remember, I remember this. I think I said in another video, and I did. My prayers were usually help, and I'm sorry. <laughs> Always feeling condemnation when Romans 8 tell, tells us there's no, there's not no, now there for no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Christianity fully didn't get it, and I never got it. It's such good news. It's such good news. Be conciliated to God. And we're conciliated to God. He's conciliated to us, but not everybody's conciliated back to him. And so what a beautiful gift. What an absolutely beautiful gift the evangel is. God is so good. Christ Jesus is so good. How can we not just have joy? Knowing that we know the truth. To understand, to read the scriptures now and completely understand. And understanding God's plan for the eons. And then beyond that, when he's all in all, it'll be a new story. We're not told that yet. We only get to a certain point in the unveiling. And with the Apostle Paul, actually Apostle Paul goes even further about the God being all in all. And he completes the scriptures. Anyways, grace and peace to all of you today, or tonight, wherever you are. I uh, greet you all with a holy kiss, and I'll talk to you again soon. I'm at 16 minutes, I don't want to keep it too long, but I just got so much joy reading that, and I hope that um, you did too. Sometimes I screw up my reading, sometimes my reading glasses. And I realized that Martin's print in the book is a little small. Anyways, I just wanted to, to share that. I didn't know I was going to share that, but I always like what God's going to do. It's great. And uh, I hope that you're blessed by it. Talk to you again soon, okay?